thank you. So welcome back after the fantastic uh, ride that we had uh, this afternoon. So I'll try. I know that uh, I'm, I'm the only thing that uh, uh, stands between you and your bed, essentially. So I'll, I'll try to uh, keep you awake and do the same. If you see me fall asleep uh, during the lecture, uh, don't hesitate to, to wake me up. So uh, I'll, I've slightly modified, of course, the plan of the lecture to take into account the fact that I moved less uh, rapidly in the first lecture than I thought. So we will continue, actually, a little bit with the Tomonaga Latina liquid. Uh, and I will do a certain number of things that initially I didn't plan to do, like fractionalization and topological excitation, in order to synchronize with the lecture of Emmanuel, who will show you the experimental data uh, on, uh, on these things. So uh, just let me remind you, I will also try uh, I will also try to write uh, on the tablet uh, because I think it's probably better than on this uh, very shaky board. Uh, if this poses problem, then don't hesitate to uh, to let me know. But I think it should be visible enough uh, uh, on the screen. So I wanted first to to go back a little bit to what we did because I realized that I was not clear enough uh, in what I tried to explain, and there was a kind of collapse of two very different ideas. So I remind you the goal of the game is to try to solve 1D interacting quantum problems. And you saw several examples of this in the other lectures. Uh, it can be a, a Hubble model, it can be XXZ chain, it can be many, many terms like this. So actually last time we did two things. The first thing we did was to establish a dictionary which consists in rewriting the single particle operator and the density operator in terms of two new fields, which I call phi and theta, which are collective variables, if you want, which are related to collective excitations. And of course, these phi and theta are not independent, and they are essentially conjugate. So if I take a phi of x and 1 over pi grad theta, uh, sorry, uh, no, 1 over pi grad theta of x prime, then these things are essentially obeying canonical commutation relations. So if you want, phi and theta are kind of uh, canonically conjugate. And this dictionary is valid always, in the sense that it's something you can use for whatever problem you want. It's a 1D problem, it's a problem made of many couple chains, it's a ladder, it's a super complicated problem with whatever uh, 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 interaction you have. You can always try to use this change of variables if you want. Now, of course, as you know, it's not because you change variables that you solve your problem. So this is just a change of variable, and this change of variable goes by the name of bosonization. So that's the the, the, the historical name, as I explained last time. Now, it turns out that this change of variable is super efficient to solve many 1D Hamiltonians. And again, I remind you one of them, which is the Lieb linear model, which is 1 over 2M sum over dx grad psi dagger grad psi, uh, since I put the other the, uh, 2M, I could have put that on the line. That would have been better. So grad psi dagger. Right side. This is the kinetic energy, and then I can put an interaction energy, which let me call it u over 2, sum over dx of rho of x minus rho 0 square, which is a contact interaction uh, uh, that the, the particles have. Now, if I use my, my dictionary, so this is a super complicated problem because this contains four operators of bosons, so this is not quadratic. We don't know how to deal with this term. But if I use the dictionary, you see that the first term here, the rho zero exponential of i theta, when I inject it uh, in the kinetic energy, will give me rho zero over 2m sum over dx of grad theta square term, plus a lot of other terms that I've thrown away. And then the other term, which is the term with rho, if I inject my, again, my dictionary here, I will replace rho minus rho zero by one over pi grad phi. So this term here will become u over two divided by pi square sum over dx of grad phi square plus million
millions of terms that I've thrown away, and I've thrown them away under the idea that they are not relevant, that they will not change the low energy physics of the problem, essentially because they oscillate like crazy here because of this oscillation factor. So when I integrate over them, you know that if you have a smooth function which is multiplied by a rapidly oscillating function, the integral is essentially cancels. So the idea is that this term goes. And then you see that with this magic change of variable here, I've completely solved my problem because now, as we discussed last time, because this object is essentially the momentum conjugate to phi, what I get is a bunch of harmonic oscillators, and then I can compute any property that I want. And because I have harmonic oscillators, I can also compute any correlation function that I want of this object. So there are two steps. One is the change of variable, which will be either useful or not useful, but that you can always do. And the second is what is the resulting Hamiltonian that you will get after you've done this change of variable. And there will be several classes of problems. Some problems, this bunch of terms here will be indeed completely negligible. You can throw them away. And fortunately, there will be other classes of problems where these terms will play a crucial role and you cannot throw them away. And then the physics will be quite different from the standard Tomonaga Latino liquid physics. So we see examples where I cannot throw away the terms that here I happily thrown away, and we will explore the consequence study. And as I said, normally you see that here, uh, if you remember the notation I had last time, this term here I call this factor u times k, this term here I call the factor u divided by k, small u, velocity divided by k. So here I have a perfectly explicit expression of both u and k. I just need to solve these two equations. But what Haldane told us is that actually I shouldn't really do that. This is valid only if u is small, but actually this field theory is valid always, or is valid even if u can be large, provided I don't use the perturbative results here for the coefficients of the grad theta square and the coefficient of the grad phi square. So the fixed point, so here I should say these are irrelevant operators. And actually, what Haldane tells us is that there is a fixed point. And that the fixed point will be 1 over 2 pi, I don't cheat you on the coefficients, sum over dx of u times k times grad theta squared plus u over k grad phi squared. So this if you want is pi, the number pi, 3.1, blah, blah, times the momentum conjugate to phi square. And if I use the proper expression for u and k, not the perturbative expression, I incorporate the effect of all this irrelevant operator, and then my field theory is essentially exact. So I can compute correlations with this field. Okay. And then, uh, as uh, I was mentioning, you can do that for other systems such as spins or, uh, or uh, fermions. So let's go back uh, to the slides. And now I would like to present to you other properties that one can deduce from uh, the field theory uh, that uh, are a little bit less obvious than just the Paolo correlation functions that I showed you uh, last time. And the most important other property is what is known as the fractionalization of excitation. So let me try to, oh, that's interesting. Let me try to uh, take the example of spin one half. So spin one half, you've seen several Hamiltonians uh, several times in various lectures, but the, the one I will use is this one. It's the XXC model. So it's something where I put a different coefficient in front of the SX, SX, and SY, SY term and uh, uh, in front of the SC, SC term. Uh, and uh, then you can use either the boson or Fermion mapping, uh, and then the representation of the, of the spins is given by uh, essentially the same field, exponential of phi theta and the uh, uh, phi uh, field that I have. And let me explain to you briefly why. I think it's, it's not too complicated, so I can, I can do that without entering too much into the 
terms. So now if I wanted to describe spin, so if I wanted to describe spin, as we discussed, I can use the mapping where I say a spin one half has two states. It can be either down or up. And therefore, I can map them on boson state by saying spin down is absence of bosons on one side. Spin up is presence of one boson on the side. And of course, I cannot have more than one boson on the side because I have nothing above spin up. So I need to put plus constraint which says that I have, if you want, a local repulsion U, which is infinite between the bosons. This is what is, goes by the name of hardcore bosons. And then I can use the perfect mapping for the, uh, uh, between the spins and the bosons. I can say that S plus is B dagger. You see that if I apply S plus to spin down, I get a spin up. If I apply B dagger to the vacuum, I get something which has one boson. So that works. And then I will have that SC is the number of bosons. So it's B dagger B minus one half. So if I have zero bosons, my SC is minus one half. And if I have one boson, my SC is one minus one half. So this is one half. Okay. So this is a very simple mapping. And if I use this mapping, then I can rewrite my XXC Hamiltonian as JXY, as I wrote, sum over I of B dagger I plus 1 BI plus Hermitian conjugate, so B dagger I BI plus 1. So this is the term that corresponds to SX, SX plus SY, SY, which is S plus S minus plus S minus S plus. And then I have a term which is JZ here, sum over I of what? Of B dagger B minus one half times on site I, B dagger B minus one half on site I plus one. So you see that the JZ term corresponds actually to a nearest neighbor repulsion or interaction, let's say, because JZ can be negative, uh, interaction between the bosons. And of course, in addition, I could add a term here, if you want, that's, that's more uh, moral than something else. I could add here a term which is plus u over 2, sum over i of b dagger i bi times b dagger i bi minus 1. And then I need to let u tend to infinity to have the hardcore constraint. Okay. Now, this is like my Lieblinger model, or this is like my Hubble model, with one exception that usually we like to take for an antiferromagnet JXY positive. And here, I usually when we write kinetic energy, we like to put a minus sign so that the minimum of energy is at Q equals zero. So let's take this into account. I'll do simply a transformation where I will multiply the boson operator B dagger I by minus 1 to the i, b tilde dagger i. And if I do this, you see that all terms b dagger b stay invariant. And the only thing that I change is that now I put a minus sign in front of the kinetic energy term, if I write it in terms of the b tilde. So I can take my representation here. Except I have to multiply the single particle <coughs> operator. For the density, I don't have anything to change. But for the single particle operator, I have to multiply by minus 1 to the i, and here by minus 1 to the i. Now the question is, what is the density of bosons that I should take? That someone has an idea. How many, how many bosons do I have if I want to describe my spin chain? How many bosons per site? Zero, one, two thirds? One. One would mean that every site is a spin up. So, probably not that. So, you can answer this by computing the average 
of the magnetization on site I. This is the average of B dagger I, B I, minus one half. And what is the average of SZ on site I? Zero. I don't have a magnetic field, so my density of boson rho zero is one half. And it will change if I put a magnetic field up to saturation, where then I will have exactly one boson per site, which is the maximum I can do, or zero per site, which means I've saturated my speed chain with the opposite. So I let you do as an exercise now to use the uh, to use the dictionary and to uh, replace in the various terms and see what field theory you will get for the for the boson. Okay, so let's continue the let's continue the, 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 the spins. So here is the representation of the operators with the same field phi and theta that I wrote before. You recognize for the density, you recognize the minus one of a pi grad phi, and then the first oscillating term. And because rho zero is one half, the two pi rho zero is pi times x, and pi exponential of i pi x is minus one to the x. So this is exactly what you get here. Okay. And you get correlation functions that decay <coughs> again as power laws using the same technology that we described before. So I have a question for you. Without any calculation, I take the Eisenberg Hamiltonian. So I take Jz is equal to Jxy. What is the value of k I should use? Y. Uh, no, so the Eisenberg model, which has a Jz which is equal to Jxy, it doesn't map to free fermions. This would be the one without the interaction term that maps to free fermions. So you're right, if I have just the so-called xy model, where Jz is zero, then I should use k equal one, which is free fermions. But if I have Jz equal Jxy, what should I have? Y. So if I have Jz equal Jxy, my model is invariant by speed rotation. So this correlation better be the same than this one, which is essentially Sx Sx or Sy Sy. How can I do it? This has exponent 2k, this has exponent 1 over 2k. So the only way these two correlations are going to decrease the same way is if k is equal to 1. So here, without doing any calculation, I can say that if all what I told you is correct, the exact value that should come from an exact calculation of k, not the perturbative calculation, but an exact, should be k equal 1 half. And then you notice, by the way, that the other parts match. If I put 1 half, I get 1 and 1 here, and this is 1 over x squared. So this works. This is consistent. And this is a model which is solvable by Bethlehem that, so you can Use better that to extract compressibility, to extract the velocity of excitations, and check that indeed when you do Jz or Jxy, miraculously, you find one half. Okay, that's nice. So this is like we did for the bosons. Now, where does it become fun? Well, it becomes fun uh, when we look a little bit more what are the excitations of this system. By the way, just the physical interpretation of these two, of these two variables, you can view theta and two phi essentially as the polar and the asymmetrical angle of the spin, of the spin. So if you were having the spin as a little vector, you can imagine 2 phi as being its deviation from the z direction, and theta as its position in the plane. And because these field phi and theta are conjugate variable, it tells you you cannot determine both of them with infinite accuracy because of uncertainty principle, which tells you that in a spin one-half, you cannot determine the three components of the spin one-half uh, identically, because they have to satisfy the canonical uh, commutation range. OK. Now, what are a little bit the excitations? So I will do cartoons. Of course, one can do serious calculations based on bosonization. I will give you an idea on how one does it later. But let's do the cartoon first. So naively, what is the minimum spin excitation that I can do in such a system? 
The thing I can do is flip one spin. Okay. If I flip one spin, what are the quantum numbers of this excitation? Well, it's easy. It's delta Z equal minus one. Let's say one doesn't work all the And that's the minimum I can do. There is nothing less that I can do because whatever I do, I can take one spin one half and just flip it. So I can do excitation with delta S equal two, equal three, equal four, but naively, you would say you cannot do less than delta S equal one. Just like if you tell the, the charge is the charge of the electron, I cannot cut an electron into two. Here, it's the same. I flip a spin, the minimum quantum number I have is one, and in high dimension, this excitation has a name, it's called a magnon, and it behaves very well like a particle, namely if you create it with a momentum Q, it has a well-defined energy whose de which depends only on the momentum of the excitation. Okay, there is a lifetime, so there is a broadening in the energies, but essentially it behaves as a particle. Now, you know all the fact that with quantum numbers, you can create larger quantum numbers. If you take an atom, you could say it's like a clump of charge, which has a charge which is the multiple of the charge of the proton. And if you're not accessing energies which destroy the nucleus, you don't care. You view the thing as a big block. So that we know how to do. Higher quantum numbers. Now, the fun is that in 1D you can cut the electrons into it. So let me show you what happens. Let me flip the, ex the, the excitations here and create my magnon. Notice my magnon is essentially three spin close together. Now I use S plus S minus in the Hamiltonian and I will flip these two spins. So I apply the Hamiltonian one time. Now I apply it another time. Now you notice what happens. What happens is that here now, I have a chain where I have only two spins down, which are close together. And then I have turned the spins here behind this place compared to their original positions. Now I can do the same thing on the other side a little bit more rapidly. And then what you will see is that my original background had completely disappeared. I have no place where I have three spins down close together. But what I have instead is two magic places here, one and two where I have two spin down close together, and then between them I have this chain of overturned spins, and trust me on that, we'll see later how to compute this, but of course, each one of these excitations now carries a quantum number, which is one half. So my original magnon, which should have been the elementary particle, has actually decomposed into two sub-particles, which tells you, which told you that it's not the elementary excitation, something which is an excited state, if you want, some, something which was an artificially bound state of two particles. And each one of these excitations carry now a spin which should be impossible, which is a spin one. Note also that this excitation is not a local excitation, because it has a string of turn spin which follows it. So that's why the magnon is the lowest local excitation you can do, but it doesn't live in a 1D environment and it breaks down into two collective or topological excitations that carry actually a quantum number which is lower. The only example I know of a similar thing in higher dimension is Laughlin quasi-particles in the fractional quantum Hall effect where the electron, if you want, split into whatever, three particles which carry each one a charge one third. But in 1D, it's more the rules than the exception. So here is what is called fractionalization in the sense that some elementary local excitations actually are not the good excitations, but they will separate into real elementary excitations, which in that case are called spinons and carry a spin one. Now again, let me emphasize that the spin-on is a non-local excitation. If you wanted to create one spin-on, not two, you would have to turn half of the chain up to infinity. And of course, that's not something you can do with a local probe, which will by definition only affect the chain at a given point. That's why 
usually they are created in pairs. Now you can easily imagine in cold atoms, and I'm sure Emmanuel will talk about this, because you can address any single site situations where you would create such an excitation individually and then see how it works. The second point which is important to, to note is that this excitation, because again, it consists in an infinite number of turns spin here, has a hidden topological order, and we'll see in a moment where we can identify this topological order. And uh, last but not least, actually, your pool magnon is not having a well-defined energy. Why? Because you can take its momentum, split it as you want between the two spinoids, and the energy of the particle is the sum of these objects. So take, for example, momentum zero. You can take k1 equal minus k2, which means that here the energy is 2 cosine k1. So you have a whole continuum of excitation. So it's easy to work out this continuum for the case of the spin-ons. And here is the shape of the continuum. So at q equals 0, as I said, you get a whole continuum which corresponds to this sum of these two cosines. So this is uh, going from uh, uh, 0 to 2. Uh, if you add the momentum which is pi, because the momenta of the spin-on are constrained in the Brillouin zone, which is uh, uh, half of the Brillouin zone, uh, so it's pi over, minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, the only solution is uh, that you do plus pi 2, plus pi over 2, plus pi over 2. And that's why here it's really a thin line that, that appears. But this is the shape of the continuum that exists. So this is a continuum that has a long history. It's called the Decloiseau and Pearson continuum. It was first obtained by Betanzat solution. So this is something that came out of the Betanzat solution. But this is something you can understand very well uh, by this simple argument that I, that I gave. Uh, let me show you an experiment that was done in the group of Christian Weg at PSI uh, using neutron scattering. So neutron scattering is essentially, let's forget the details, is essentially giving you uh, the energy uh, momentum uh, dispersion, so this is uh, uh, essentially the intensity tells you a little bit where, uh, how strong is an excitation that would carry this energy and this momentum, and you see indeed that what you see is far from a single line dispersion, it's something which is filling, of course not uniformly, uh, the top is much less, uh, uh, has much less spectral weight than the bottom, but is filling this decloiseau pearson continuum. Actually, on the right is a theory uh, that corresponds to the calculation, actually not exactly for the system that was observed experimentally, but close enough for uh, quantum speech. Okay, so uh, this is the simplest example that one can have uh, with uh, uh, fractionalization. Uh, okay, just to show you uh, that using DMRG, one can get a very precise calculation of this spectra, but let me skip that. Now, how can I identify this excitation? <laughs> okay, so let me go back to my field theory. These are my operators, and actually, I give you the solution of the exercise I asked you to do. Yeah? Yeah, so going back to the previous of spin on the magnons, yes. so if we take an anisotropic uh, moment, yes. so does uh, the number of spin ons uh, gets created from the magnet depend on the magnitude of the anisotropic? No, actually, because you need to conserve this. So actually, you will always create two spin-ons out of one magnon because each spin-on has to carry a spin one half. I will tell you why in five minutes. And therefore, you don't have the choice. The magnon quantum number is one, and the only thing you can do is to split it into two spin-ons of spin one half. So the anisotropy is not changing the quantum number of the spin. It will change its characteristics, the way the domain wall is spread, the velocity, so this is affected by the anisotropy, but the, 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 the charge, if you want, or the spin of the spin-on is a topological number, it's conserved. It will not change if you put anisotropy. Are there other questions? Sorry, this one? So you wanted to, to me to tell you? Okay, so the, the, the point is the following. Uh, yeah, maybe I should have, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Sorry about that. It's back. Blah, blah, blah. As soon as Microsoft wants it. So, the Hamiltonian has two parts. 
So this is Jxy. Then I get Sxi. Sx, sorry, let's say Sxi plus 1 Sxi plus Sy i plus 1. S, Sx plus i Sy. And S minus is Sx minus i Sy. Then I substitute, I, I do the sum and the difference. So Sx is S plus plus S minus divided by 2. And then this will become sum over i of S plus i plus 1 S minus i plus S minus i plus 1 S plus 1. So actually the S plus S minus is directly coming from the Sx Sx plus S y S y part. And the other is just i. And the z part. So the z part in my cartoon is I, I, I swept under the rug, but of course, if one does the serious calculation, uh, yeah. uh, you, you, you can take it into account. Other questions? No? Yeah, too many things on my desk. <laughs> I, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I'm waking up at night, you know, and thinking about the things on my desk. <laughs> So actually, I will give you the answer to the exercise I asked you to do, but try to do it. See if you find the same result. Let me take the XXZ Hamiltonian or the Eisenberg Hamiltonian. Here is the field theory we get. So this time, so I, I wrote an action. OK, I hope you're not frightened by me going from an Hamiltonian to an action. The, uh, Pi square term is becoming a velocity square, so it's the time derivative of the field. And I've chosen this time, because I'm a masochist, uh, to express it in terms of theta instead of phi. But again, I, it means to say that the grad phi term is the momentum conjugate to theta. So it's totally symmetric, it's just where you put the k. That's all. Okay. So here is the action. So normally, I should have had only that. And this time, among all the oscillating terms that I told you, you can throw away because they don't matter. Well, unfortunately, one of them is not oscillating. And it's there. So you have to add something which is an integral, non-oscillating, of cosine 4 phi. And now we are stuck with an Hamiltonian that a priori we don't know how to treat. So we'll discuss how to treat this Hamiltonian, probably not today, but uh, in part at the beginning of tomorrow. But for the moment, trust me, doing a renormalization group analysis, you can check that this term is it's irrelevant. So even if it's there, it's irrelevant. We can use all the power laws and whatever. It's irrelevant, but it's there. So now, let me look a little bit what this term will do. This term will still want phi to stick essentially close to one of its minima of the minima of the cosine because otherwise I will pay a large energy G is of the order of Jz okay so essentially this tells you that if you want the field phi to exist uh, with a low energy cost you would better have the field phi stick around 0 or around 2 pi over 4 or around 4 pi over 4 and so on and so forth. Otherwise, if you do uh, another value, which is far from the minima of the cosine, and you do it on an extended length of the system, you will pay a huge energy coming from this term. So you don't want that. OK, but what does it mean? If now I look at the fact that the SZ, remember, SZ is essentially minus 1 over pi grad phi. So let me integrate SZ from minus infinity to plus infinity to see what is the what is the, the, the value that I have for S. Well, it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the gradient of phi. So it's the value of phi at plus infinity minus the value of phi at minus infinity, period. And now you see that I can classify my state by these values. So I have several possibilities. Either the value of phi at plus infinity is the value of phi at minus infinity, for example, 0. And then I have a variation of Sz, which is 0. I don't get any spin excitation. But I could inject here 
zero. And here, the first possibility that I have is 2 pi over 4. 2 pi over 4 is pi over 2 divided by pi, it's 1 half. So you see that the excitations that are allowed are the excitation that corresponds actually to domain walls where phi will vary from one value at minus infinity to potentially another value at plus infinity and the values are totally constrained by the coefficient that I have in this cosine. And so here, the coefficient is one half and this corresponds to the spin. Of course I could do two spin-ons or three spin-ons or four spin-ons but I can do something from zero and to pi over four so it tells you that the minimal excitation is one half. It also tells you that this has a topological character because it's not something you can deform. Either you get phi which is zero, meaning one of the minima of the cosine close to minus infinity, and zero or two pi over four or four pi over four, but there is no intermediate because if it was an intermediate value over an extended distance, you would simply pay an infinite. So you have a classification of the excitation and you can simply by looking at this Hamiltonian again without doing calculation you can read what will be the minimum quantum number that you can obtain from this excitation. So let me show you an example. Let me take a, a chain which is dimerized. So I put strong bonds and I put weak bonds and I put strong bonds and I put weak bonds and so on. Now, of course, you would say, okay, on the strong bonds, let's say these weak bonds would not exist, then I would go to singlet, singlet, singlet. My two spin one half would form singlet, okay. Now, what would be the field theory that I would get? If I work out this field theory, you can check that this term, this alternance of strong and weak bonds with a very small variation here, would give a term which is sine to phi. So now, I would go from minima, which are zero, and then 2 pi over 2, two uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 2 pi over 2, which means this time the excitation is delta s equal to 1. So this time, the minimum excitation I can do is an s equal 1 excitation. Loudly speaking, it corresponds to transforming one of these singlet into a triplet. Triplet, which has two spin up and spin. Now I can do something different. Let me take the spin chain. Say, and put a nearest neighbor interaction. This is what is called a frustrated chain. Because you see that if I make this coupling happy, up, down, up, down, then I make this one extremely unhappy. Because this one would like also up, down. It's an antiferromagnetic coupling. Of course, if the sign of this is positive and the sign of this is positive. So the system doesn't like too much to be like this. So it might try to do something different than up, down, up, down, up, down. And actually, this system has a quantum phase transition. But again, let me ignore that. This time, the field theory contains a cosine 4 factor. So the excitation of this system will be again spin on with S in So you can read the quantum numbers. And that's actually something which is interesting to measure and to detect, which is when you will get excitation which again have a topological nature but which can have charges which are either integral or fractional depending on the system. By the way, this system you can also view as what people call a ladder which is a system made of two chains where you would say here is one of the coupling J1 and this one is now the coupling J2. So whether I want to view it as a single chain or whether I want to view it as a triangular ladder that's question of perspective that the physics is the same. Okay, so that's for spin system. So do you have questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. Two. Sorry. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but this piece again oscillates and I throw it away. Yeah, you're right. This is uh, you know, you could say it's high velocity and waving, but it's at the end it turns out to be a correct calculation. But you're absolutely right. I throw away this piece because I say this piece is oscillating and therefore it will not count. <laughs> no other question on that? Yes. 
So what does it mean that uh, your topological term is irrelevant in the RG sense? It means that at the end, I can compute all the correlation functions without keeping this term. So I will get back the same power laws that I showed you before, dependent on k and so on and so forth. If this term was relevant, what it would like is really to block phi in one of its minima. And this would open a gap in the spectrum. So we'll discuss this a little bit later. This is very important, for example, for the mod superfluid transition with bosons. But if this term was relevant, then my Hamiltonian is not quadratic. This Hamiltonian is known under the name of sine Gordon Hamiltonian. But then the spectrum would be gapped. So here, it's, it's there in the sense that it still constrains a certain number of properties of the system, but it's not changing the asymptotic decay of the correlation function, which are still behaving as power laws as given by this pure quadratic No other questions? OK, now let's do it a little bit more, and let's go to fermions. So if I have fermions, again, I flashed the slide last time, but let me spend a little bit more time this time. How do I go from bosons to fermions? Well, boson operator commute. Now, I have this excellent representation for boson operators, so I will not throw it away. But I need to find a way to make something here, which I will call my fermion operator, anti-commute. And the way you do it is by adding a, 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 a phase, which will be such that this phase will give you an extra minus sign when you exchange the operators. This is known under the name of jordan wigner transformation, so I don't know uh, if you already encountered the term, but I think it's sufficiently important for me to, to write, it, uh, write it for you. So if I want to go to fermions, So if I want to go to fermions, then what I need is to have the fermion operator at point x anti-commute with the fermion operator at point x prime. So I put a plus here to re-emphasize this. So this is delta x minus x prime. And so with boson operator, I have the opposite. I have the fact that actually it's a commutation relation. So the trick is to add an object that when you will commute it with a fermion operator will simply give you a minus sign to compensate for the minus sign that will transform your commutation relation and anti-commutation relation. And I let you do it as an exercise because uh, this is relatively straightforward, but it takes a little bit of time, that in that case, um, the, the, the way to do it is to add exactly the factor exponential of i phi l, where phi l was the field that I defined uh, that I defined before. This is a representation that has been heavily used to map spin operators, not onto bosons as I did for you, but onto fermions, because that way you don't have to put the constraint of non-double occupancy. The price you pay is that now your spin operator are not a local function of the fermion operator because you get this field which is in the exponential and which is quite unpleasant. So it's not because it's a free fermion theory that you know easily how to compute the correlations. Okay. So you do this, and this is now what becomes your fermion operator in terms of the phase. Forget the prefactor here, it's not important. The main point is that because you get this extra part here, Instead of having 2p here, you now get 2p plus 1. But this is important because before you had the term with p equals 0, and the field phi was completely disappearing for bosons. So the lowest term for bosons was just exponential of i theta. Now for fermions, you can never cancel the oscillation, and you can never cancel the field phi. If you take p equals 0, you get exponential plus this, if you take p equal minus 1, you get exponential of minus this, which immediately tells you that actually the fermion operator is made of two objects that oscillate with, with oscillation pi rho 0x and minus pi rho 0x. And that is very easy to interpret in saying actually 
If I have fermions, well, if I have fermions, then what do I have? I have a system which has a Fermi level. Yeah. And then I have objects which leave all this is occupied, so I don't care. And my elementary excitation will leave around here and will leave around here. So there will be excitation around k equal plus kf and around k equal minus kf. And you can check if you have a density of particle which is rho zero, kf is exactly pi times rho zero. So what this formula has done for you is to tell you that actually the fermion operator, psi of x, is made of a superposition, so I could write it that way, is the sum of a k of exponential of i k x c dagger k, which is decomposable into two sum, the sum of a k close to kf of exponential of i k x c dagger k, plus the sum of a k close to minus kf of exponential of i k x c dagger k, and then I can rewrite this by adding uh, kf if you want. So this is exponential of i kfx sum of a q close to zero of exponential of i qx c dagger kf plus q plus exponential of minus i kfx sum of a q close to zero of exponential of i qx c dagger minus kf plus q. So this is the Fourier transform of a slowly varying field, which people call the right movers. And this is the Fourier transform of a slowly varying field, which people call the left movers. And so you see that you can write that your fermion operator is exponential of chi fx psi dagger right of x plus exponential of minus i k f x psi dagger left. Objects. And so what you have is the bosonization representation of the right movers and the left movers. Okay. If you want, it's like if I had said, I take my Fermi dispersion and I linearize around this point, and then I have a Dirac equation where I will have right movers and left movers, and I have two species of fermions with a certain uh, point. Okay. So, back to the slides. And now we are having the right, the right and left particles. And again, it tells you that psi dagger right is exponential of i phi minus phi plus exponential of minus i theta, and the other as a, as a sign. Uh, the density density correlation is exactly the same that we had before. Okay, I won't do it. Now, what is the fractionalization for fermions? Okay. And I will do even worse, I will do fermions with spins. Now you will tell me, how do you bosonize fermions with spins? How would you do it? All right, let's say I want to solve the Hubble model. Do we try to solve the Hubble model? So if I, solve, if I want to write the Hubble model, someone has to write the Hubble model, I think Emmanuel uh, wrote it, but I'm not even sure. So this is the simplest model of fermions on the lattice. So you get minus t, which is not the time, it's the tunneling, sum over i, c dagger i plus 1, sigma, where sigma are the two value up and down for the spin, c i sigma plus permission conjugate. So this describes particles with a given spin, which are hopping with an amplitude t among the sides of a lattice. So sigma is, of course, up and down. And then I put an interaction which is local. And because Pauli principle prevents two particles of the same spin to be on the same side, the only interaction that I can have is ni up, ni down, where ni sigma is c dagger i sigma, c i sigma. So this is known as the Hubbard model. This was introduced in 1963. So it's 
quite tangent. And that's the drosophila of strongly correlated systems. It's, if you cannot solve this one, well, most likely you will not be able to solve a more complicated model. So it's the easing model of strong correlations. It's not particularly realistic, necessarily. It's a very, very severe simplification. Only local repulsion, uh, particle described in a tight binding representation, and so on. But you know, it contains the essential ingredients that you expect in a strongly correlated matter. Okay. It has been solved so far in d equal one and d equal infinity for the fermionic one, and that's it. So if you have 15 minutes tonight, don't hesitate to try d equal two. It's uh, quite important because some people will say it's the solution to high TC superconductivity. So there is a big, big, big challenge to understand what are the properties of this model in two dimensions. In one dimension, as I said, we have good control on this model now, but it's still something which is extremely challenging uh, to understand. Now, I can give you the exercise because I want to do it in the time which uh, remains, which is the fractionalization. But I suggest as an exercise, bosonize this model and solve it. And believe it or not, you have the tools now in 10 minutes to solve this model. Which, you know, if I had given you this and told you, take this model and solve it, without talking to you about bosonization, probably it would have taken you more than 10 minutes. Okay, now it's not 10 minutes, it's still a good calculation, especially if you don't know many terms to know the answer. But it's not unfeasible. How, you, how would you bosonize these problems? Well, you write a field phi and theta for the spin up, and you write a field phi and theta for the spin down. They are distinguishable particles, so you can classify them totally separately without any problem. So you will introduce the field phi up, a field theta up, a field phi down, a field theta down, and then take the formulas that I showed you on the slide to uh, rewrite this problem uh, as we did for the bose hubbard model or as we did for the, for the other. But that's not what I want to tell you right now. What I want to do is the same cartoon than I did uh, before to do the fractionalization. So let's imagine that I have a ground state, which is the ground state of this Hubble model. So I have a system which is made of a bunch of particles which can move, but which have also a spin, either a spin up or a spin down. Okay. Now I will represent the ground state this way. So the little ball means that I have a particle. And the arrow tells you what is the spin of the particle. And again, because it's a cartoon, I project along the z-axis. And I choose a perfect antiferromagnetic arrangement, which, of course, is not the ground state of the Hubble model, but close enough. This will be Paolo order. OK. Now, let's imagine that I do something, which is to remove one particle. So I've removed a charge, E, and a spin. Here, I've removed spin up. Now again, let's let this thing evolve. So particles will move, will, will, will change. So again, I flip the spins as I, did, as I did before. And my spin is moving. And at the end, it will go to a configuration like this. Now you notice what I have here. Now you recognize this structure. This structure is all spin on. But note that there is no charge which is missing here. Okay. My spin has been changed. Remember, I removed the spin up. So it's normal that somehow my quantum number is now minus one half. And indeed, I have a spin on which corresponds to two spin down particles. But in this region of space, I have no charge which is missing. So if I look, it's like if I didn't remove any particle at all. The particle which has been removed, it was here. And now I can let the other particle move. And note again that the particle is moving and that the spins in between 
are keeping my perfect antiferromagnetic arrangement, except it's shifted by one. So again, the string is in the other direction compared to the initial state. And after a while, what do I get? I get a region here where if you look, you will see down, up, down, up, down, up, and so on. So you will see a perfect antiferromagnetic arrangement, but there is a charge missing here. So you have an excitation here, which doesn't carry any spin deficiency, but carries a charge deficiency. This is something that people call the hole, because it has a hole. Don't ask too much imagination. There is a very good Calvin and Hobbes scout in the world. <laughs> uh, this part is the spin on, so we keep the same name. Yep. Who came up with this name? I think the whole on, the spin on is ancient, and I don't know who invented it. The whole on is Phil Anderson. Oh. I think. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make, especially on record, the claim of priority. So if someone has a previous claim on the whole on, Speak now, stay silent forever. <laughs> uh, no, but I think the name all on is Philip. The concept is, of course, uh, 20 years ago. So it just didn't happen. OK, so here we have again fractionalization. In the sense that the fractionalization in the spin chain was that you had the magnon, which was a spin one excitation that broke into uh, a spin on and a all on, uh, sorry, two spin ons. But here, what we have is an electron, or a, a, a particle, which carried charge and spin, which disappeared, and now is transformed into two collective excitation. One excitation that carries spin, but no charge. And one excitation that carries charge, but no spin. And you know, I don't need to go further to tell you that then the physics will be quite different from the physics of higher dimensional systems, because there you have good individual single particle excitation. It also tells you that every time you need to put the packet back together, for example, to let the electron tunnel from one chain to the next, this will complicate matters. So this is opening a whole can of worms to have the uh, most elementary excitation we normally have, which is the uh, electron, or whatever the, the name of your particle is, to decompose again into fractionalized into uh, 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 spin excitation and charge excitation. Uh, the, actually, the, 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 the splitting is further than that in the sense that you can show that at low energy, the Hilbert space is completely decoupled into a sector that only contains spin excitation and a sector that only contains charge excitation. So this is really uh, uh, serious, and this is what people call spin charge separation. Now, this has a certain number of consequences. Uh, yeah. Can we say that the Molon moves at the very most? So, each of the objects, the spin on and the Molon, have their own U, which is neither of them the Fermi velocity. So, you start with the Fermi velocity, and then you have the interaction, and the interaction will affect in a different way the velocity of the spin on and the velocity of the boron, the same way that when we were doing the bosons, we had, among the Latin liquid, we had u, velocity, and k. But this time, you have a velocity u for the charge, and the velocity u for the speed. But neither of them is the, just the Fermi velocity. They contain the interaction as well. And that's what makes it interesting, because of course, my cartoon would be true even if there is no interactions, but then the spin on and the boron always move together and you keep your particles. But once you have interaction, they move at different velocities, and this velocity can be extremely different. Actually, you can bring one close to zero, while the other will stay finite. If you get, for example, close to a multi-insulator, the charge is not moving very fast. The spin continues to move with, uh, essentially, uh, velocity. So no, they are not the Fermi velocity, uh, but they, 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 they are a mixture of the Fermi velocity. It depends on the interaction, and it depends on the filling. If you are close to half filling, one particle per side, the Holland velocity can tend to zero, because you are close to a multi uh, If you uh, uh, go to very large U, the exchange, the magnetic exchange is T squared over U, 
and the spin-off velocity is proportional to j. So there, on the contrary, you bring the spin-off velocity to nearly zero because you bring the magnetic exchange to nearly zero. So you can really span the whole the whole range depending on filling and depending on interactions. Are there other questions? Of consequence that I want to write because I think you will see uh, 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 exploration, uh, let's say, uh, example of this in the talk of Emmanuel. So there is the fractionalization, so I won't go back in what I said. Now, notice that we had this strange antiferromagnetic order where I told you I get the charge, then I get up, down. Up, down. So actually, it's an antiferromagnetic order, but where I shift a little bit the, the presence of the up by one side because I have a charge. So if I look at the spin-spin correlation function, spin doesn't matter which direction, it's isotropic, so let's say SZ of X, SZ of zero. The question is, this will oscillate cosine nya, 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 x, and then decay as a power. Okay. For once, I don't care about the power. What I want to know is what is the oscillation. If I am in a perfect antiferromagnet, you would say it's up, down, up, down, so the oscillation is pi. When I move by one side, side, I change that. Actually, for the Hubble model, because I shift by one every time I get a charge, you can check that the oscillation will occur exactly at 2kf. So although it's locally commensurate, because every time you get a charge, you will shift the phase, and this shift at the end will add up to give you an average modulation vector which corresponds to uh, if you remove the charge and squeeze the chain, you go back to one. Of course, it's very difficult in a condensed matter experiment to do that, but you will see that in four atoms, it's quite possible. Now, okay, I would like to uh, finish on showing you, after all, you, 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 you could protest and tell, okay, you, you showed uh, uh, this very nice uh, spin charge separation, uh, blah, 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 that's perfect, but your cartoon is crap. Because uh, why doesn't, well, it's crap because, okay, it's done with PowerPoint and with my limited skills, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, that is a valid reason. But uh, an invalid reason would be to say what would prevent to do that in higher dimension, after all. So let's try the same cartoon in higher dimension. So here is the 2D Hubble model. Well, the cartoon 2D Hubble model. So the same thing, I remove one particle. And then I start flipping the spins as I did before. Blah, blah, blah. And then you notice what happens. Because I have this string here of spins which are turned the wrong way, because again, the spin on and the hold on are not local excitation, they carry behind them the string. Well, I have here an horrible energy cost with the neighbors, and an energy cost that grows as the separation between the spin-on and the hold-on will grow. So it's like confinement of quarks, if you want. The further I try to pull them apart, the more energy I have to provide. So you get a bound state, and then this bound state you can call a quasi-particle, which will carry the charge and the spin. So at least this mechanism, naively, will not work, will not carry, in higher dimension in a trivial way. Of course, it doesn't mean that there is no way to get fractional charges or whatever in higher dimension, but not with this naive uh, approach. There is what people call confinement of spin-on and hold-on, or same thing, play the same game with the two spin-ons we had before, add new chains around the spin chains, and you will see that the spin-ons are confined. Maybe tomorrow I will show you an experimental plot because it's too beautiful to pass, because it's like an hydrogen atom, you can do spectroscopy of the bound state of the two spin-ons, and this has been done by neutron scattering experiments. So this is really beautiful, but the point I want to make here is the fact that here you would have in higher dimension, because of the confinement due to the other chains, you would have a string connecting spin-on and hold-on, and 
that's why you get lambda quasi particle, that's why you get Fermi liquids in higher dimension, because you cannot separate arbitrarily the charge and the spin, at least by this naive uh, mechanism. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Oui. So, so it should be uh, by just looking at like dynamics of the whole of the resistance, can you understand the dynamics of the whole? So what you're saying like they're not separated? Well, I'm saying they are not separated, so at the end you have a bound state yeah. which will carry both the charge and the spin, and this is usually what you would call a lambda quasi particle, which is like an electron. Sorry. It's like a free electron. An electron with maybe a renormalized mass. Okay, so it's like Fermi. It's like Fermi. Yeah. I'm just saying that you recover the idea that in 2D you will not get this spin charge separation, which would hold uh, at least. Are there other questions on this? No. So just to uh, tell you what I want to do uh, at the beginning of tomorrow. Well, we described uh, systems which were very simple so far which were systems which were either in the continuum. OK, on speed chains, I, there is a lattice. But let me add explicitly a periodic lattice time on my boson and consider the case where I have exactly one boson per site. And what I will show you is that using bosonization, this is a problem that can be solved relatively easily. And that's the problem of the mod transition. That's the problem where, because of the repulsion, the bosons will not want to hop anymore because if this guy hops on the next side, then it will have to pay the repulsion and it prefers to stay in this, it's like an egg box where you put one egg in each uh, thing, you don't see the eggs hopping uh, from one minimum to the next. And so there will be a transition between a super fluid state and a state which is completely insulating, where nothing moves in the system. And this is a problem which has been studied in all dimensions. I will show you that again using bosonization, that's something on which one can make a lot of rapid progress in one dimension. And actually, this is a problem deeply connected to a topological phase transition, which is the topological phase transition, namely the Beresinski Kostelitz Taurus uh, phase transition. And that's a good example to test. So I think it's a good time to stop here. Uh, I'll take questions, and I thank you for your attention. system we can think about uh, spin up and down and then yes. define from the ground state high amounts and spin up. Yes. So can we think, I mean how can we intuitively think about spin one system? Ah that's a very good question. So spin one it's a famous uh, it's of course a famous example because uh, this is the this is what uh, uh, put uh, Aldein uh, in Stockholm essentially uh, you could have gone for many other reasons, but uh, so how can you think about uh, the spin one system? If you want to do it through bosonization, actually, it's interesting. There is a trick which is due to uh, Alan Luther and I think Timon, and I should recheck the second person, but Alan Luther, I'm sure, which is simply to write a spin one as the sum of two spin one half. Okay. Now, of course, it's wrong. It's wrong because the sum of two spin one half has four states. It has the singlet, and then it has the three triplets, which are exactly the spin one. But if you have a singlet and you say, I want me a spin chain, the singlet would cut the chain because it's non-magnetic. So there would be no exchange that would carry with the neighbors. So it's something which would immediately bring you to a high energy state of the order of J. So if you're looking for low energy states, it's probably not a big mistake to replace a spin one by two spin one half. Now, of course, at the end, we will have a gap state, so we could discuss which gap is bigger. But let's, uh, let's carry on. So I can write now my spin one J as J sum of S1 plus S2 scalar on side I plus 1 scalar S1 plus S2. So you can view this either like I wrote, or you can say it's like if I had a ladder with two species, 1 and 2, and then it's a ladder with weird coupling. It's a ladder where I would get exchange between this side and this side, but I would get exchange J between this side and this side, 
I would get exchange between this side and this side, and I would get exchange between this side and this side. And actually, that's another exercise you can do. You can bosonize this thing very well, and you immediately find the other. Well, immediately may be too strong a word, you find the other. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean it's a very simple solution of the allergen. Once you buy this trait, when you buy this ID, that it doesn't spoil the, the, the low energy properties to replace spin one by two spin one half, it's actually makes your life very easy. Actually, you can even carry it out to spin S. There is a beautiful paper by the late Schulz on this in 1996, it's written here, 1986, sorry. I, like, I can write the reference in the notes where he did the spin s chain by simply writing a spin s as the sum of many spin one half, and you find the alternance uh, between gapped and ungapped. Uh, what is remarkable is that Aldein, who essentially invented, I would say, the modern form of bosonization, used a different technique in his original paper to derive the Aldein. It's remarkable. He, he, he didn't use bosonization, or at least not in the published version. But you can use spin one by using this. But quite generally, your, your question is absolutely uh, important in the sense that we want to also address this more complicated case. For example, the ladders, where you would like to say, for example, I have two chains. I have my exchange J here, but I put an exchange J per here. And OK, what are the properties of this system? Now, I can still use my dictionary, but of course the Hamiltonian I will get is much more complicated, so there it doesn't give me immediately the solution. So there was a lot of effort that was invested in trying to understand the properties of these systems, uh, for example, using bosonization, using numerics, using experiments, and so on, because now uh, okay, that becomes a difficult problem, not to mention when you put more links. So we'll go back on that type of questions uh, tomorrow when I will discuss a little bit the open questions. That's part of it. As soon as you start coupling one key chains, you're, you're, you're in bad trouble. So spin one is already coupling one key chains. Are there other questions? 